Paris Hilton says that I was the one who committed the crime against Joe Francis. At this point, he already has 70-something felonies that he's facing, all related to the Girls Gone Wild videotaping. As soon as he comes into his home, I hit the flash grenade. Are you yeah. in his house? Yeah. He doesn't know who he's pissed off that has sent me. I put him in his car. You know, I've already radioed to my guys that I'm leaving the house with him. I grew up here in L.A. in the Hancock Park area. Or mile or two to the west would be Beverly Hills. Having grown up there, went to school with guys that are now big-time actors that were just, you know, teenagers working on their craft at that time. I grew up in the boxing uh, community. So leaving out of that area, uh, the gym I had started going to initially was a Broadway gym, which is in Watts, right in the middle of a war zone, you know. But um, in the 90s, when I was going the early 90s, it was like uh, it was a no-go zone as far as gangs uh, coming to the gym or even though that's their neighborhood, it's like, you're going to the gym, you're a boxer, you're not gang banging. If so, you wouldn't be in the boxing gym. You'd be out here, you know, with us on the streets. So um, whether that was like an official word or it just was the flow that happened over time, that's that's what I experienced. Uh, getting to that gym, you know, I'm traversing 15, 20 different neighborhoods on the bus, you know, and later when I get a car, it just, you don't think much of it because a lot of the guys in the gangs, you you went to school with them, junior high, high school, whatever, you know them. Uh, you're not trying to join the gang. So it's okay just to be, you know, who you are. Uh, I've, I've said to folks before, I've never had that, you know, uh, the boogeyman moment from the gangs where, you know, they're going to pressure you to join, you know, right. like old PSA commercials about, you know, watch out for the gangs. Uh it's okay for you to be a square, go to school. If you want to join, all the opportunities are available. Black gangs, Hispanic gangs, whatever. Uh, I, I just always gravitated more towards uh, uh, organized crime uh, in a less street level, you know. Right. I had started working early on uh, just doing collections for a bookie. Uh, a guy I know, family, friend connection from another guy and you know you start off small you keep going in whatever crime you're doing uh you look up a year later you your assignments have gotten bigger uh you've moved from just collecting to busting a window because a guy's not paying you know send him a message his window gets busted at his business he knows he has to pony up yeah uh, another guy who decides not to pay on a bigger bet or, you know, he, did, he didn't pay up a loan. Uh, you go to the next level. Eventually, you're sitting outside waiting for him with a Louisville slugger. Yeah. So you continue in the game. Um, you can be so successful, you get busted. <laughs> you right. are su so successful in your criminal enterprising, even at that level, that you draw the attention of the authorities. Uh Congratulations. You've now graduated to juvie. You've now graduated to the county jail. Now, how and, old were you at this time? Uh, 14, 15. You know, there was no, um, I mean, I, I was not running the crew or whatever. I'm one of 10, 15 different guys that the bookies got, you know, they can call up to these little poot butt assignments or whatever. But in that time of being around, you're going to always come across a, a bigger opportunity. No different if I just completely stuck to the uh, education route. Getting A's, I'm at school, I'm in the debate club or whatever. Those opportunities will present themselves. Right. So if you, me having sought out the criminal space, the opportunities presented themselves. I rose to the occasion and went to the next level, went to the next level. And uh, eventually I got uh, incarcerated in juvie. So, you know, my last year or two of high school was spent in juvie. And, um, you know, coming out of juvie, uh, I just went right back into the same flow. 
And that's when I got introduced to another level of, of, um, uh, the, the bookie loan shark space and my mentor who I had worked under at that time, uh, this guy, Plucky Zajek, uh, he plugged me in with his old school connections, uh, which extended to guys from New York. And that's when I first started working under, working with, working under, um, uh, Matty the Horse I know, you know, he's, he, I mean, his crime goes back to the 60s in New York. You know, he was an underboss of the uh, of a Genovese family at one point. Um, you know, in the, the show, The Deuce, they profiled his story in that, um, in the late 60s, 70s, you know, he financed a bunch of the uh, gay bars, you know, Gay guys didn't have a place they can go. Some didn't want to be outed. A lot of folks maybe not wanting them in their club with their lifestyle. So he financed a lot of it in, uh, you know, the Lower East Side, uh, Times Square area and made cash, you know. Yeah. Didn't care about your lifestyle. He just saw an opportunity to make cash. You know, he had his hands in the uh, pornography space. So, he, you know, he was multifaceted. Niche, niche markets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Markets that some guys didn't want to be a part of, but he's like, there's a buck to be made. All right. That's that. Uh, the money spends. Um, so me getting a, a connection to him and some of his guys, uh, I could call up, go to a meeting, and the assignment is, you know, hey, can you go pick this up in uh, Michigan? Can you go pick this up down in uh, Atlanta? These are these are my connections. These are my crimes. Whatever's going on, they just they knew that I could be trusted from the guy picking up. You're picking up cash. You're picking up uh, picking up cash, delivering messages because uh, m maybe some of their direct guys. I'm not Italian, so right. clearly I'm able to pass by <laughs> um, certain things where they are already being watched, or you know, it looks like. Uh, the heat is on. So sending a face like mine down to one of their assets, picking up cash, delivering messages, dropping off stuff. Uh, and them also knowing that if, 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 if shit got crazy that I could handle it because they've already known, you know, my profile, uh, trust it. I'm not about to pick up the cash and run off to Mexico. Every dollar always got to where it was supposed to go to. And, you're doing that, you know, an assignment will come my way uh, because it's out here in L.A. or it's in Vegas or Orange County or San Diego. Hey, let's throw the, throw the key at this assignment. No, no, uh, no obligation on my part to take it because I'm not Italian. I'm not under their wing. Uh, they're farming out work. They could farm it out to anyone else. But for me, by that point, I had a trust level. So uh, how old are you at that point? I'm in 20s, 21, 22. Okay. Um, and uh, money's good. Work's coming. I'm working legitimate gigs. I'm in college. I'm moving around. I got a buddy at that point who already started an online gaming site. You know, this is in the years when online gaming was completely illegal, uh, all based out of Costa Rica. You know, in the early 90s, he had went down to Costa Rica and learned the whole system, you know, or mid 90s, rather. So when he started his own outfit, it was a matter of like, you know, this is the wild, wild west still. Uh, nothing like it is today where, you wow. know, it's it's like pretty common to place a bet on an online site. But this is in the day when it was, you know, illegal. So you you're you're tiptoeing around. Uh, which jurisdiction you're in and, you know, how exposed you are and how, how much you can actually advertise. Uh, so having it, I have an online, sorry, I have a quick question. So when they're telling you, Hey, go pick up this, go do this. Like, are you thinking like, Oh, this isn't a big deal. This is my buddy. So-and-so, or are you realizing like, Hey, this is, this is serious. This is a, uh, are you like, like, how are you? You know, like, like, it's funny because, you know, some people are like, like, listen, like this is, this is serious, serious shit. Like I could get in a lot of trouble and they're, they take it super seriously. And other people are like, oh, that's my buddy, Tommy. He just wants me to swing by and pick up this. And that's, it's not a big, 
And somebody might be say, say to you, you know, hey, this, this is serious. What if this happens? Oh, that's not going to happen. Like, you know, are you, you, you seem to say, how serious are you taking this? Is this just like, it's not that big of a deal? Or you think, no, no, I, I know it's a big deal. I know, oh, no, I know it's a high priority situation. Every, every situation is high priority. There is nothing to be taken lightly. You know, you're you're given the the rules of the road. You're given the layout, what what it all entails. Yeah, you know, it could go uh, bad. It could go bad, yeah. But uh, you know, a lot of guys, Italian guys, especially from that are under um, Maddie the horse's uh, uh, thumb. They're being watched. They may be watched. They may be on something else. So a lot of the stuff that was being thrown my way through my guy, Puggy, was, uh, you know, it wasn't time sensitive, like, hey, you got to be there in five minutes. It was laid out very clear ahead of time. And me being tossed the job was because, once again, I was an Italian. Uh, I was trusted, you know, as time went on and um, never made the mistake. You know, it was... Um, a lot of it was a matter of it's on your timetable, but you know, this is what needs to be done. Whatever that this is, here's how you go about it. You do it one or two times, three times, four times. You're like, okay, the kid can be trusted, you know, um, throw another assignment. Like I said, you get tossed, you know, they, they got a guy down in Orange County who, you know, has uh, taken out some longs and Maybe he's paying one or two, three times to keep it looking like he's going to be good. And now he's uh, now he's not answering his calls. All right, somebody has to go visit that guy. Right. You know, so being tossed an assignment like that and, you know, there's a couple hundred grand on the line. What you retrieve, you get a piece of it, you know. All right, now I put together a crew. It's Orange County's, you know, an hour drive from L.A. We'll be there before night. Maybe we're posting up for about... <laughs> you know, two days waiting for this guy to show up. But, you know, what What that situation there turns quickly from a loan shark situation into extortion and possibly kidnapping. Right. You know, if the guy that owes the money decides not to pay up, you know, you make a threat. All right, now you have extortion, possibly a terrorist threat charge. Uh, if, you, if you crack the guy... You got an assault charge. Okay, if I snatch him, toss him in the... Okay, now you got a kidnapping charge. So it's like the situation seemed simple enough to start with, but if it goes sideways, which most of the time it does, you're now looking at kidnapping, robbery, extortion. You, you, your problems are, you know, are taken to the extreme in a quick second. And, you know, and it all starts off of a guy who decides he doesn't want to pay righteously what he righteously owes right you know he didn't go to the bank and get a proper loan he he went to the streets and you know got some money agreed to the vig and now for whatever reason maybe he legitimately can't pay because the business is going upside down uh at that point you know wh what is his business you know maybe he owns a furniture store all right well how much does he owe what does that look like in um in the supply that he has on hand you know are we going to take all of the flat screen televisions to try to equal up to all the furniture all right now we have to offload all that stuff uh, one one of the craziest pieces i had come across was a uh, a guy was a wholesaler of uh meat coats it doesn't get that coat in LA in southern california but you right. know he couldn't pay. Not that he wouldn't pay, it's just he could. Folks run into very hard times, which is why he got the loan to start with. Uh, but we now have a box truck full of sable mink coats. <laughs> so right. we now have to offload these to, you know, make to make make right on what he owed. Uh there's no there was never a, a boring, boring day. There was never a dull moment because moments like that come up all the time okay all right so you're in your 20s at this point you're getting these assignments did you do you end up getting do you end up graduating school where were you going to college i started out 
Junior College of Ventura County. Then I eventually went over to Germany. I mean, I, I traveled a lot. I got around a lot. Um, crime was just a matter of what comes up and I'm on it. Um, how, how intricate, how, how complex is the crime itself? You know, it's a, in a 12 month calendar, maybe two, three big things will have happened, but you realize also all the stuff that happens throughout the week. It's all, it's all crime. You know, it's right. The pickup, the drop off, taking the bed, you know, it's you're in violation of the wire act when you, you know, take a call on the, uh, take a bet over the phone lines, you place a bet online, you, uh, you're going to go pick up, uh, a simple conversation. You know, you, you owe a couple grand. I'm here to pick it up. All right. That's an extortion charge. So crime was happening every day to some extent, uh, bigger items came up at different times. And, and by that point I knew enough guys, uh, bloods, crips, Hispanic gang members that I would farm out a lot of work because uh, I knew those, these guys from school. I knew these guys from having been in juvie. So I had, I had my own net of guys that, you know, were on the streets every, every day. They're already, you know, caught up in the gang war. So, you know, they don't have a problem with, you know, going to that extreme if it calls for it. Granted, I'm the one responsible for them if I bring them on a, a situation, but you know, so at that point, I, I got my own uh, assets that I could call up and uh, bring a situation to. Um, so, you know, that's what crime is. You build relationships just like you would in the in the legitimate space. Uh, I'm in the club scene in L.A. I mean, had been since I was a kid. I grew up in L.A., so going to the clubs was, you know, you, you would, as time goes on, you you know the promoters, you know the owners, you kn you've known them for years, you're from there. Um, who who do you come across in that club scene? Everyone you see on TMZ now, you know, like this celebrity. Okay, well, I knew him like 10 years ago when he was like a starving artist or whatever. So I was like, oh, great, he's on a billboard now. Uh, it, it was not a big thing. You know, growing up in LA, I, I can finally remember um, you know, walking the streets of Hollywood or walking, uh, you know, to the, to the, to the movie theater. And there's a, a film set going on, you know, that was an everyday occurrence. So it was no big deal to see a celebrity, uh, being in the gym environment. Um, I grew up in the gyms with Mickey Rourke. So it's like when he was at his, the height of fame, you know, tough guy status. And it's like, Oh yeah, that's just Mickey. We're going to, you know, go a couple rounds in the uh, sparring or whatever. Right. Just keep rolling with it. It's no big deal. Uh, buddy Baltazar Getty, we were in the same boxing crew, you know, um, for years. I don't know how many times we've, uh, you know, getting ready for a competition and just hating life because we're at lunch with other buddies and we can't eat because we're trying to make weight. So, uh, my buddy Scotty Khan. I mean, hey, you got some time today? Let's get some rounds in. This is, you know, when he's just popping as a actor. Then he gets Ocean is Eleven, and it's like, oh shit, that's Scotty up on the billboard. Just another day being in L.A. You know, you keep going. Oh, they got Ocean's Eleven Part Two coming out. Oh shit, Scotty's on the billboard again. Great, I'm gonna kick his ass at in the boxing gym, though. You know, <laughs> so that's L.A. You know, if 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 I grew up in Pennsylvania in a steel town, I would imagine that, you know, the guy who got stuck in a, a mine. Oh, shit. That's my buddy, Johnny. Right. Johnny. OK. Um, you know. Oh, but for me, it was. Oh, shit. Scotty's on a in the next Ocean's Eleven movie. Right. All right. Good for him. So what happened? So you're you're in the the club scene um hanging out with people i mean what's um you know what what kind of what happens next what's going on after that well first of all why why'd you go to germany did you go to school uh, in germany i heard you say germany yeah yeah i i traveled a lot traveled. when i was in um 
when I was 18, I started working for TWA, the old airline. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as an employee, you would get um, discounted air tickets, uh, like 10%. You'd get these passes and you could, you know. So I'd schedule my, my school and my work schedule to where I can get five, six days off, you know, miss a class here or there. But I'd be gone. And TWA had great routes, you know, JFK France, JFK London, uh, down in Mexico. So anytime I can get a couple of days off, change a couple of shifts, move this around, I'm only paying like, you know, for a twelve hundred dollar fight, I'm paying 120 bucks and I'm in I'm in Paris. <laughs> you know, so right. if, if there couldn't have been a better job for a young guy working for the airlines where you're able to travel. Uh, you know, this is all pre nine eleven, so if the flight was booked, no big deal. I'm an employee. I get to sit up where the pilots are at, you know? Right. So, you know, and then this is in the time also where, you know, I could just have, if, if you and I worked together, you worked in the office with me, I could just, I can get free flights by having you call from like the corporate office saying, hey, we got an employee who has to take this paperwork. Let's say if I'm going to LA, New York, uh, he, he needs to get to New York, you know, the flight's booked but you're calling from corporate. They're not going to question it. I'm on a flight for free. So I, I just, I bounced around a lot. I traveled a lot whenever I could. I take whatever vacation I could, uh, you know, come back, work like a dog, uh, making some decent money as well. But it was, uh, it was a great opportunity to see the world. So I ended up in Germany. You know, you always, it's always come down to chasing a girl in some kind of fashion. So uh, it was nice. And I checked into school over there for, for a little while, came in and out. Uh, I just bounced around a lot, um, a lot of travel. So just bouncing around and, and enjoying uh, the ability to move around. I had some a lot of disposable cash from different gigs, different assignments, legal, you know, legal and legal. Uh, dabbled in the online uh, online space mid to late nineties when. You know, companies were going public and, you know, if you get in at the right time, you may make a little nice profit, take it to the next venture. I'd have some illegal cash from work in the streets, put that in the stock market, uh, see if you can flip it and make a profit. Um, there was no shortage of opportunities mid to late 90s. Uh, the online space was emerging and opportunities were there. If you had a little extra cash to put in, you may make a little mint, uh, made some money on uh, Beanie Babies, you know, uh, pets.com before they went belly up. Um, yeah, maybe uh, it you know probably would have made more had I taken a bigger risk, but I was just jumping in and out of different ventures. And but the one consistent was the crime, right? You know, involvement in crime there was a consistency there and uh, just like I said earlier where you keep going you get to a ne the next level uh, more trust is in you know m more trust is thrown your way and you rise to the occasion whatever it may be discretion you know if situation calls for it hopefully it's not something that you know it's in the public's eye um, opportunity meeting and availability uh, were, willingness were you thinking at that time like i mean did you have an end goal were you thinking you're just going to kind of be a hustler the rest of your life or do you have a goal like hey i at some point i want to become i don't know a mailman or a, a cop <laughs> or you know um or a like you know hey i want to be get a, i want to be a cpa someday like was there a goal in mind or was like you're just kind of hust you were just kind of hustling until something something came along no I mean having grown up in LA um, buddies you grew up with that are at different levels of the entertainment space you know some that are the actors some that are behind the scenes producing film the goal was uh, you know you got you got an out date some guys don't some guys are just this is what I know. I'm going to write it until the wheels fall off. Uh, my, my number 
you know, whether it was a million, two million or whatever, or whether it was just a time frame. Um, uh, in the next two years, I anticipate I'll be at this level, whatever that number is. And from that point, I get to uh, step aside. You know, uh, some guys make that mistake stepping away from the daily. And once you step away, don't try to go back in. You know, little pieces of the game maybe have changed. Uh, conversations you would have had with certain guys that you haven't seen in a while. Like, uh, I'm going to I'm going to tread lightly because I don't know where this guy's been. You know, you've you've heard you've heard enough stories where a guy's gotten pops. All of a sudden he disappears. He pops back up. Yeah. And now, now he's, he's talking a little reckless. It's like, where's this conversation coming from? Right. So, you know, being more aware of all of the trappings that just come with being in crime, uh, knowing that uh, simple conversation, what you look at as simple conversation could uh, have you on the tail end of a conspiracy. <laughs> Those things start weighing on you. So I'm looking at, you know, well, you start seeing people get popped too. Every periodically, you hear about yeah, you're seeing enough. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy got you hear Jimmy, Pauly, and these other fifteen guys were indicted, yeah. and they all got raided yesterday, and they're all you know they were all yeah. Out. So you you start becoming a little bit more risk averse, and um, you you're looking at all right. I'm I'm at this level financially. Uh, I'm comfortable enough to step aside, or I'm comfortable enough to open a bar. Uh, put some money over here. That way it's still running. And, you know, if I am still going to be involved in crime, I could be more selective uh, in what I involve myself in. Maybe I'm a, a one level removed or two levels removed because I, I have enough guys that I can farm work out to. That becomes uh, the thinking as you're in crime for several years and you've built up enough of a of a network reputation wise my my goal was going full time into uh, the film world you know i already had a couple of projects that i was looking to pursue me having my own personal um out you know, expiration date for being involved in crime it, in uh, what capacity as a producer uh director you wanted to write screenplays you you know you want to be an ex you know like what in what capacity in the you know film industry did you want to work yeah as a uh, initially producer because okay. uh so a friend of mine who had started his online gaming company late 90s uh me having already been involved in the uh bookmaking operations the old school style uh loan sharking when i joined forces with him you know i'm now in the online space, but I still have, you know, the street level going on. So, you know, we were doing all kinds of, uh, uh, promotions to get the online name out there, you know, and having grown up in boxing, having grown up in the gambling space, uh, and having known all of these guys at these different online, uh, sites, goldenpalace.com, uh, SBG, um, you know, these are companies that were early, early to the game. You know, I was hooking up the promotions with professional fighters who are fighting on Showtime and HBO at the time, uh, doing the fake tattoos on their back. You know, the, uh, you probably remember the biggest one was uh, uh, Bernard Hopkins had uh, GoldenPalace.com on his back for a fight. A lot of fighters were trying to, they were, uh, networks and promoters were trying to push them out because of networks and promoters weren't getting a piece of that advertising dollar you know you pay a fighter 30 grand to put this fake tattoo on his back for the night his right. fight is being held on showtime there's going to be a million eyeballs you know the possibility of the traffic being driven to that dot com you know was it was proven to be a, a good success so i mean i'm i'm working angles like that have known enough from known enough fighters known enough guys at different online uh, gaming sites, that was one venture. You know, an another venture is, um, uh, you know, having enough guys I know at the in the club scene. You know, we would rent out a shell of a NASCAR and how NASCARs have all the advertisement on it. We'd slap um, the dot-com name 
on this shell of this NASCAR, have it outside the club. Two, 3,000 people are coming to that club today. It's on Sunset Boulevard. There's going to be thousands of people. It's a Friday night, so folks are cruising Sunset Boulevard. They see this NASCAR with the dot-com name, the mobile advertising. So I was constantly uh, involved in, on the, on the legal side, Yeah, um, schemes like that to promote the shit out of the company. And it, it was fun. I mean, it, it was no different. All of the planning that went into planning a crime now was going into planning these these promos you know uh different girls around town you know that are at whatever level as models you know getting them and this is all pre major social media you know right. my space isn't even out at, at this point so it really is uh whoever the gatekeepers have said okay she's a legit model this wasn't just because the girl got five thousand likes on her photo you know she had to be a legit model to be uh, looked at as someone would care uh, to see what she's promoting, you know, throwing up some billboards, uh, hiring taggers who are already spray painting walls to throw, uh, to just go gorilla and throw up uh, stickers of your dot com all around town on buses. Free advertisement right there, you know? So, um, yeah. And, as you look up, as the years goes on, you you may not think about it. You didn't sit. I didn't sit around and write out a list of folks that I know uh, that are celebrities or that are have become uh, renowned in some way in the entertainment space. But you're constantly mingling with folks that are on uh, on billboards, folks that are on in the magazines. Um, this is Hollywood. That's that's just the nature of being in the entertainment capital of the world, you know? Right. So the um the what's the guy, the girls gone wild guy? Joe what's Francis. The, Joe Francis, sorry. Yeah. Um so I mean I remember, you know, I remember Girls Gone Wild. You know, they had the videos. Remember like the V they had the tapes, they had the I remember seeing the commercials. They had the infomercials. I actually had a broker, a female broker that worked for me, a mortgage broker that had actually been on one of those, you know, one of the, you know, when she was whatever, 19 years old, something like that. And he, he had made a bunch of money, uh, doing that. Do what, what was, that was about the, the same time, right? Like he's making bank. Yeah. He's making the yeah he, his his videos and all the commercials. You start seeing them early late late ninety nine early two thousand, and he's everywhere. You know, um, and from the outside it looks like, yo, he's he's caught lightning in a bottle, right? Which for the time he did, you know, uh, the places he was at these spring break locations, these girls were already gonna be in the wet t-shirt competitions and this and that uh them getting the trucker hat for showing their boobs or a shirt that says girls going wild was like the extra pin for them probably most of them never thought much of it because they were already letting loose they're on spring break you know yeah um so yeah he he he's not that guy joe francis wasn't from la but once he started making some good cash you know he's sets up shop in LA and he's on the party scene as well. So I came across him all the time. I knew enough folks that knew him. You all, every party, there's always the after party and uh, a guy like him who's trying to buy his way into the party scene, into the, the club scene. Uh, by that point, he has the nice big house up in Mount uh, Bel Air. So yeah, after party at my house. You're now at his house at an after party amongst whomever else decided to show up that was already the cool kids at the club. Right. So it's, it, it was no, it wasn't a big stretch to be able to be around him once you're already in the scene. Um, yeah, he, he, he didn't, he, he already had started to get a bad reputation as being a sleazeball. But, uh, one thing, yeah, one thing about celebrities, though, is that uh, 
most folks wouldn't turn away from him because he's the one buying all the liquor, trying to right. buy his way in. Uh, of course, he's going to have the coke because he's trying to ingratiate himself into there. Of course, he's going to host the parties because he's trying to get everyone around. So uh, most celebrities like will look sideways. Like how many how many celebrities were attached to uh, uh, Weinstein? I was just going to say Harry Weinstein. <laughs> yeah. 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 All of they all wanted to be hear the rumors. They this that, but yeah. he's rich. He's powerful. They all want to be in a film of his. They all want him to produce a film of theirs. So it's like, hey, whatever I heard, uh, blinders on, you know? Yeah. Um, well, with him, and that is with with Weinstein. There was the extra incentive of the fact that you know he was powerful and he could he could crush you too. He could also make it very difficult right. for you to work. Right. So you know, but yeah, yeah, it's. Um, double-edged sword but uh, you know you look up and 10 years have gone by and it's like now one of the rumors is it's definitive this did happen yeah and it's like oh man but um i i think leading up to about we're we're at the middle part of 03 is when my world and joe france's world really collided Right. Uh, I had gotten called to a meeting and, um, you know, at the meeting, I'm given a rundown of what transpired or rather what this girl, 18 year old girl who was down in Mexico with a couple of her friends, the story she had told her father. And the story was that, you know, they're down there partying and while they meet Joe Francis, um, they voluntarily party with him smoke some joints, alcohol, whatever else, all above board. It's all good. They go back to his place, partying with them. And the girl says when she woke up in the morning, she knew she was no longer a virgin. Okay. So she agrees that all of her partying with him was all good, voluntarily left with him, but she did not consent to sex. So is she Uh, thinking a a roofie? Um, Is that what she's thinking? Yeah. She's like, you know, can can it, can but uh, can't say what happened in these hours that she was, you know, mentally not there. Uh, but, you know, waking up and she's questioning him and he's, you know, pretending like, yo, you know, we talked about this. We we said we we're going to do this. We said we we're going to do that. Yo, you came to my place. Right. He knows that she didn't consent to sex. So she she can't do much. She says, you know, she tries to talk with the authorities down in Mexico. She goes, no, it goes nowhere. Yeah. I'm sure they were a, a huge help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, she can't do anything here in the States because it's not, it was not U.S. jurisdiction. So she tells her dad, her dad happens to be connected with Maddie, the horse, his guys. That's when I get called to the, uh, to a meeting. Okay. Now, Easily, they could send a crew to whack him. They could easily hire someone to to take him out. But the father, his his position was he wanted Joe Francis to suffer uh, in the way that his daughter suffered. You know, she's having nightmares. She's you know uh, afraid to go out. She's afraid of men because she was just taken advantage of. So the father's position was: I want to see. I want this guy going forward every time he goes home to be afraid of what might be on the other side of the door. So, you know, my only questions were, you know, like you want him physically jacked up? No, 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 I just really just want him uh, afraid of the phone ringing. You know, he hears the phone ringing, he's he's in fear. Um, All right, my only other question is, is there a time limit on this, you know? No. Cool. So... I'm I'm sitting with that information. Uh, I doubt if the girl was lying. You know, pretty intricate, pretty detailed on her part as to what happened. Um, well, and if I think if she was lying too, she would have probably given a more clear um, account of what happened. It would have been very clear. And I said she's saying, "Look, I don't 100 percent recall what happened. Yeah. Like I definitely like I yeah. think I was drugged. I only know that this is." I'm definitely yeah. not intact anymore. Um, yeah, you know and this so, girl is not, and this girl was not from story. LA. 
Yeah, she's not from L.A., nor was she trying to be a model, an actress, or anything. Uh, their worlds just happen to meet down in Mexico. Right. Uh, she, out of all names, she pulls this name out of the out of the hat. It, it wasn't, you know, by haphazard. There was no axe to grind on her part against him. Their worlds really don't exist. Uh, never come in contact with each other. Right. Um, it just so happened that. I'm associated with the guys that her father was associated with. Yeah. Her father's not a tough guy. He's not a, he's not in the streets. He just happens to know guys. Um, you know, those guys knowing that I'm in LA, that I know LA, I know the party scene. Uh, probably I will know Joe Francis. So when I'm brought the information, like, of course I know the guy I, you know, he, he's gambled with me before, you know, He's not a great gambler, so I, I appreciate his losses. Um, so that's when I started, you know, putting together a, a plan of what uh, uh, of be- the best way to go about exacting revenge in the way that that where this guy would be afraid of what's on the other side of the door going forward. Um, they didn't want him beaten down. They didn't want him shot or anything, or because. They didn't need me for that. They could call up any number of guys that were already on the payroll that, or that are just, that's what they do. That they're the soldiers in that way. So we, we come to the last part of 2003 and a good friend of mine at the time who was dating Joe Francis. Uh, she was a model chick, Aaron Noss. She's um, at that time, she had just been in Playboy. She's, Frederick's a Hollywood girl. Her poster billboards were all around town. They were dating. And I, I had just got back to LA and I get a call from uh, a, a mutual friend of ours that Aaron and our, uh, our mutual friend lived in the same building. And she calls me and says, yo, you got to come over. Something just happened with Aaron. I get there and Aaron is like white as a ghost. Um, she's no soft chick you know she can hold her on and uh she tells me the story she's dating joe francis at this time uh and she's telling me the story that she's going to go drop him off this is like two days before christmas actually she's dropping him off a christmas present because they're going to be with their respective families on christmas and she says he must have been coked up or something because when he gets drugged up he's turned into another person and uh he started grabbing at her and she barely broke free and got out of the house now their boyfriend girlfriend it's like why are you uh why are you trying to you know why are you getting aggressive with her or at matter she believed attempting to rape her right you guys are already uh, yeah. in a sexual relationship um so that that right there if if i was if I was sitting on the fence on making a move on him, seeing that, and, and I was, I got to her like, you know, two about two hours after it happened, so it's fresh in my mind now, uh, what she had just went through. So that further informed my decision making into uh, into what what I eventually would do. Okay, so. Um... Okay. So what, what, ha- so were you, you were obviously being paid for this. Like was a number thrown out? Like. Nah, payments come in many forms and this is a, a favor for, for, this is a favor for the family, so to speak, you know, um, favors come in many forms. So I wasn't, I wasn't worried about a number. Okay. The father would make do. He would make right. Um, I'm sure if I had said him said to him two million dollars, and if he had it, he'd pay it because uh, of what his daughter had just went through. Right. So no. that wasn't that wasn't the motivation. Uh, the money. It was. It was about this guy. Is uh, especially after the situation that Aaron relays to me. You know, less than two hours from it happening. This guy, he needs to be made to, uh, 
he needs to be made to fear the way he's making these girls fear. And Aaron, this other girl, uh, they weren't the first ones, you know. I'm a, I'm in LA. I'm in the in the party scene. You're you're constantly hearing, you know, he was going to be an investor in a a new club opened up. The investors gave him his money back because pre-opening he's already grabbing the hostess's ass, you know. He's already going off crazy on girls. Uh, he was he was a loose cannon. He's, right. Physically, he's not a, a threat to a guy, but to a girl, yeah, he is. Uh, and and the the stories around town were once he gets juiced up on whatever drugs, he def he goes into a, a whole nother space. So you know, whatever may exist just on him being sober is one thing, but once he has some uh, alcohol and whatever drugs in his system, then he's on a whole nother level. So are at this point are you are you starting to kind of formulate a plan? Like what is that plan? What is your yeah uh, at at this point now we're into uh early january 2004 um i already got the breakdown of what happened what the girl says happened in mexico other things around town things i'm hearing and then uh day or two before christmas Aaron's situation so yeah i've, I've already had some gotten some eyes on him on joe francis locking in his schedule um exactly what i'm going to do it's it's coming together um it all depends on where it's going to happen but being at the father's position was it, if he is doesn't it, it's it's one thing if he was to get jacked up by a couple of guys um like he's coming out of the club and some guys snatch him there ah it's a random crime in the streets right if someone snatches you in your home well this might be really personal here you know right so that's when i decided okay i'm gonna i'm gonna grab him and at his home and the, the plan was pretty straightforward i knew when he was gonna be going down to mexico he was building his villa down in mexico so he's back and forth he's going back and forth there a lot uh but i also know that Regardless, like, you know, he, he could have court the next day, but he still wants to be out at the club the night before because that night is the happening night for that particular club. He, he can't resist being out on the town. Um, wh one other thing. At this point, he already has like 70-something felonies that he's facing in Florida, all related to the girls going wild, uh, videotaping. Okay. Down in, I think Panama City, Florida. He was arrested down there. And what so are the, he has a lot going on in the what? criminal world that he has to resolve. And what are those? Girls. What are those? Uh, they were related to some of the girls were underage. Some of the girls said that they uh, didn't sign off on um, consent for their face. Yeah. Uh, some uh, some of the girls were saying they had gotten drugs. Some were saying uh, he was charged with like prostitution some of the girls that were underage you know there's these gray areas in the law that he crossed over you know he's he went from being just like a documentarian into a porn front uh, uh producer right and once you step into that realm of porn producing you have all kinds of uh, uh laws and, and procedures that you have to follow and it's a tricky space. You know, if there's alcohol involved or drugs involved, you know, did this person really uh, consent? Did this person really consent with a clear mind? So he had had, I think he had gotten like 70 something charges. He had bailed out. So he has a lot going on in his world, but yet he's still trying to be out on the party scene. So I'm going to take advantage of, of him being off kilter. Uh, so the night that, uh, I had chosen, you know, I got guys at the club watching him and I got a couple of guys on the route where he lives in Bel Air. He's, you know, a good, once you come off of sunset, you're a good five to 10 minute drive to get to his home through the windy roads. But the good part is that he can only enter through East gates of Bel Air or West gates of Bel Air. So if I have eyes right there, I know that he's, he's coming up and I got five to 10 minutes. Uh, everything plays out just how 
how I had laid it out, planned it out. Uh, I know he's at the club. I know he's partying. And uh, I have one guy at the club. And uh, well, I want to get him to be a, a little coked up. In the event something goes wrong, uh, which, you know, every every great plan, there's always that possibility. Right. Um, but in the event that he was injured or um, whatever happens that, let's say if he did go to the hospital to be checked out and they find drugs in his system, you know, you're thinking about all the possible ways to mitigate uh if if he has drugs in his system, it's like anything he's saying, any statement he's making, it has to be viewed, you know, on a, on a, on shaky grounds because he's high. He's he's right. up. So what he's already going to do at the clubs, what anyone that's at the club would see him doing a normal night anyway, it's no big deal. You know, offer him some coke, see if he takes a bump. Uh, just add in another layer of uh, of. Uh, c- contingency planning, you know? Right. So by the time he makes it back to the house and I've already been made aware of his travel from the club coming into Bel Air, as soon as he comes into his home, I hit the flash grenade uh, just to stun him, you know, <laughs> just to stun him. And then, you know, you, that buys me three seconds, four seconds to be able to hop on him and, and tie him down. It, are you yeah. in his house? Yeah, I was already, I didn't made access, had got access to his house. No, there there's no alarm? I had already bypassed the alarm. I had, I got in the code. And this is coming back many uh, weeks back where, you know, making connections with certain folks that would know all this information. Um, that's another part of just being from LA and, haven't made these connections with different folks over the years. Um, but throwing the flash grenade, screaming out to him, freeze police. That buys me a couple of seconds to, to hop on him. You know, right. Most folks here freeze police. He's not out every day and his thoughts committing crimes. So if he's here and freeze police, he's thinking it's really the cops. By the time that he realizes that it's not the cops, I already have him tied. Right. You know, he's my captive at that point. And that's exactly how it played out. I, I tossed the black sack over his head to, to further have him in the, the mind space of just what the hell is going on. You know, he doesn't have vision right now because he's has a black sack over his head. He's, he's, he's my captive. He's, his hands are tied behind his back. So, you know, I take him throughout the house wherever I want him to go. And that's and I started doing that. I started walking him up and downstairs into different rooms just to further disorient him, having him. He, he knows he's in his home, but just to have him completely feeling like he has no control over over his own body in his own home, having him afraid of what the fuck's going to happen next, you know, um, Right when he thinks, okay, I've been a captive for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Nothing's happened. Maybe I'm going to be all right. That's when I've already taken him back up to his bedroom. And when I removed the, the, the sack from his, from uh, covering his face, that's when he sees the video camera that I had set up. But he know he knows you, right? He's seen you before. Oh, we've, we've, we've had much engagement, but I'm not speaking to him at this point. You know, okay. the initial freeze, get down, screaming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's not, he's gonna. not gonna be able to place a voice. So the only time I did speak to him, very soft whisper, and he's he is in no mind space to be wondering who's whispering voice, you know, who, how do I attach this to anyone that I might know? He doesn't know what's going on. Uh, what, what, another interesting thing that he, he had going on in his own life is that he had just had a, uh, uh, a, the, a major spat with this guy, Muhammad Hadid, uh, the father of uh, Gigi and Bella Hadid. Uh, he, Muhammad Hadid is a, uh, 
a developer and he was building Joe France's villa down in Mexico. So they had a spat in, uh, in their business dealings. And the day before I committed this crime against Joe Francis, he had just went to Muhammad's business office and went crazy demanding all of his, um, his architectural renderings back. So the cops were called on Joe Francis for, you know, causing his major disturbance. So he doesn't know so, if it has, has to do with this or. So the whole time happened. that I have him as a captive, he's actually saying to me, did Muhammad send you? You know, I, I'm not going to confirm or deny anything to him. Let him. He doesn't know who he's pissed off that has sent me. That's how much he, that's how much of a fuck up he is. Right. That he has enough guys <laughs> that he's done wrong to that possibly could have been the ones that sent. And I doubt if I would have said, which was not the assignment, I doubt if I would have said, this is because you did this to this girl in Mexico. It's quite possible that he would have been lost on which girl. Right. <laughs> there are several girls in Mexico that fit, that situation fits with. So, but that wasn't, that wasn't requested. So it would have went, it wouldn't have went anywhere anyway. Um, I wanted to, you know, instill that fear into him. So at that at this point, it became uh, I'm going to do to him what he does to these girls with the video filming. Uh, have him say some you know some demeaning things on film, uh, and and that's how it played out. You know, I I did it in the same fashion that he does with the girls, where they have their identification. He has them say a line. You know, my name is Becky, whatever, whatever, whatever. So I had him do the same kind of skit. You know? Right. Joe Francis, uh, I'm a boy gone wild and I and I like it up the ass. Okay. Uh, see if see if that makes him think even more what the fuck's gonna happen next, you know. Um and it it, it played out exactly how how I had laid it out. Uh, there was no need to stick around any longer. I've already, uh, I've already gotten across to him that uh, he's made some major mistakes. He's so now vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. Now I, I put him in his in his car, and I, you know, I've already radioed to my guys that we're le I'm leaving the house with him. Drove him down Sunset, uh, down to Sunset. Uh, crossing over uh, Sunset Boulevard, and I left him. Uh, left him in his car, and I get in mine, and we we take off. Uh, he eventually works himself out of the zip ties, and he runs to the Bel Air security gate, and he, you know he's begging for help. The security person in the gate is they actually thought he was like some homeless cra crazed guy, and they didn't want to. Uh, they didn't want to help him. So they call the cops. The cops get there. The cops run, hear his story. They race up to his home and they actually didn't believe there was a crime. Like maybe he is high because right. there's no windows broken. There are no doors, Jimmy. There's no sign of force entry. All we have is this guy sweating down at, on sunset talking about he was this story to them. This sounds crazy. There's this didn't happen. There's no, there's no yeah. camera, there's no videotape, there's no... This is, you know, early days, so there wasn't... Like, there are cameras set up all throughout the route, yes. There are cameras on that cul-de-sac that he lives on, the private security cameras of those homes, but I knew where they were positioned, and nothing could be uh, seen. Well, I, I meant when the cops got there and, hey, there was a this guy set up a tripod in, in my in my room. Well, there's no tripod set up. There's no camera yeah. there. There's no there's no videotape that they can see. There's no like it, it could have been him flipping out on PCP or something and yeah. run, running down the hill like they or driving yeah. a car. And you just don't. Yeah, know. to them, it looked like he made this story up. Right. There it there is nothing that points to what your the story you're telling us nothing physically at this scene points to that his shirt is not ruffled he doesn't have any scars on him he's just a sweaty dude possibly high 
And, right. you know, having read the reports, they wanted to take him to the hospital. They wanted to test his blood. They wanted to do the whole checkup on him, but he refused. Uh, I would imagine because he was just partying at the club. And Well, he does have a pair of zip ties. He, yeah, but he does, He when he gets to this space, his hands aren't tied. One of right. them, he's worked himself out of it. So they're looking at it like, that's it the doesn't only, really look right. Right. That's the only, but that's the only physical evidence that they have is there is a pair of zip ties. A pair of zip ties that is on one of the hands. Yes. Okay. So that's, yeah. that's all they've got. That's all they've got at that time. Uh, for me to further the, um, the fear offensive, uh, this is on a Monday, a couple of days go by and, uh, I finally placed a call to him knowing that and like the guy can't keep a secret. So he's already told enough folks around town, uh, what happened to him. So I already know that the cops are waiting for phone calls. He's already made. So he allows the cops when in his presence to tap his home phone. Uh, so I just placed a couple calls just to fuck with him, to keep him one. So they stuck around for about two, three days. And then, you know, he tells them, I guess the guy's not going to call back anymore. But I've already, you know, thrown a couple of lines out there to keep them off kilter. Uh, and they're only there from certain hours. So for the entire year, I'd either place a call from a phone booth, no matter where I'm at, Arizona, if I was in New York, wherever, placing a phone call. Uh, there'd be times where I'd see him or I'd know that he was out at the clubs or I'd know that he was uh, in Florida at a certain place or whatever and I'd give him a call three, four in the morning. What are you saying to him? What I'm just, just nonstop fucking with him. Like, yo, I, I know you were, uh, hey, when you were in Tampa yesterday uh, and you were having lunch at such and such place, you know, you get this phone call at four in the morning and the guy is just for a whole year, he's just like, oh, man, this shit never ends. <laughs> you know, no matter where I'm at, this guy seems to know so much about me. And he doesn't know how. It, the girl that you knew that was dating him, is she still dating him? No. Okay. That night was the end of their relationship. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was the definitely the end of their relationship. If it wasn't already... On, it, uh, on its way out the door, that definitely sealed the deal. Um, yeah, so that whole year goes by. And in that year, uh, I'm like, I'm now done with crime because I'm, I'm making that transition to producing films. I uh, feel like you're still in crime. Well, no. You're still I'm, making I'm phone saying, calls. <laughs> no, no. The other crimes... You the other remember. crime, the everyday crime. This right here is at this, this is point, just a hobby at this honestly, point. This is just uh, is this, this is like now fun okay. to watch him. Uh, and then you know, a lot of folks in town are not knowing who's who, and some folks he would tell whatever to to someone. That word would get back just in the you know in the club scene conversation, and you I'd overhear something. So there was a little bit of. Uh, pleasure in knowing that he was running up the walls exactly what the dad wanted to happen was happening he right. was he had hired security not you know 24 hour security at his home he didn't go out without security so he's clearly shooken up you know um and you know it interrupted his his flow his life the ease by which he ran around town um which is what what the what the job was so the problem for me is that someone uh has a conversation or rather paris hilton says that someone had a conversation with her someone that i know that knew about the crime tells her that i was the one who committed the crime against joe francis okay uh this conversation she says happened we were at her sister's birthday party and in Las Vegas. So when she gets back to LA, this is now October, 2004, nearly 10 months after the crime. 
she sees Joe Francis and she tells him, hey, it was Riley who did that to you. Um, why? I'm just wondering why. Like, just yeah, there's the in the know. Yeah, there's a couple of theories. Uh, I'll go into it in okay. a sec. But Paris Hilton telling um, Joe Francis that he calls the detectives who at this point they have a cold case. He calls them in, in three ways to her, having her retell what she had just told to him. And that's the first time they ever hear my name attached to the crime. So that's when they start looking into who I am. Uh, why would she do it? Um, you know, her, her sister's home was burglarized in September of 2004. And in that burglary, uh, there were uh, there was uh, jewelry, purses, all kind of personal things, and videotapes that were stolen. Now, the sex video of her and Rick Solomon had already been released. Uh, so these videos, I know I know a lot of guys in L.A. Uh, you know, uh, it's not too hard to get in contact with someone or someone to know that I know these other people. So I had given, I got called to a buddy of mine's office and this, this crew of rushing young guys, uh, a burglary crew, they were the ones that burglarized the sister's home. So they had all these items and they're like, you know, we want to, we want to dump them off. We want to sell them. My interest was in those videotapes. So I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll buy those from you guys, you know, sight unseen there's going to be something on there. And sure enough, there was. Um, so, so that, that, that plays into, uh, why would Paris tell Joe this? Um, she thought that if she, if I get arrested, then those videotapes won't come out or maybe I don't have them any longer. Uh, cause I, I had gotten her back the originals. She doesn't know if I had copies or not. So, so, I, well, so these are these are videotapes. What was on the videotapes? There was a, uh, you know, a lot of like light sex things with her and other boyfriends. The most interesting one was um, Paris and this this uh, Brandon Davis, good buddy of hers, character I'd known for years. Um, they were out at the clubs, partying. They see a street vendor outside the club this is two three in the morning uh it's in a black it's a black guy and they're they're joking around with him and they have their video camera going so when they get a a good distance away from him uh they're joking with each other and they say these fucking niggers you right know? uh they say they she says it and it, it makes it clear that she you know, this is a word that she uses very uh, freely in her private life. So I wanted to get her attention. So I knew the re uh, this reporter from the News of the World. So I had shown her a clip of the video and she reported on it. And immediately Paris, you know, gets a hold of me. Hey, you know, I'm, I, I thank you for getting that video back for me, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm going to send over something. Hey, whatever. You, I, I was just joking. And, you know, she's trying to make her apologies yeah. to me for what was said on the video. And I just pretend like, uh, hey, no big deal. Whatever. It, that's on your conscience to deal with. So she had a little bit of a vendetta to get back at me. Um, what she didn't anticipate was once I eventually did get arrested for the Joe Francis crime, she didn't anticipate that maybe I still had access to those videos. Right. So she didn't actually never did come testify against me uh, because the fear for her, it wasn't about doing the right thing, making sure that this criminal guy is caught for kidnapping Joe Francis. It then became about, she has to save her own ass. You know, she stepped into this situation by passing this information on to Joe Francis. And now it becomes, how do I walk myself out of this without, 
you know, sustaining any blows to my, at that time, her career being on the rise. Um, so yeah, it all played out in that fashion. And this was all in a two, three month period. Yeah. Yeah. They had no idea that the cops were looking at me for this crime, for the crime against Joe Francis. So going into the first part of 2005, when I got arrested, you know, and that point from the arrest going forward, you know, that that's what I write about in my book. It's the day one of incarceration. Uh, actually, the very moment that the U.S. Marshals, you know, uh, grabbed me when I returned to my apartment. OK, so here, here's look. So somebody like what is the case? Because some, you know, Harris Hilton saying it's so and so. And then, you know, Joe Francis calling and saying it's, it's, you know, it's you. And then them looking at you for it doesn't make an arrest warrant. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's, right. that's just a, it could, that's just two or three guys saying, oh, I heard it was, you know. Yeah. So in this guy, Joe Francis can't tell a straight story. And this is eventually his inability to tell the truth is what eventually allowed me to be able to. Uh, negotiate plea bargains. So initially, he says the the guy that broke into his home and kidnapped him, tied him up, was wearing a mask. All right, which means that you know you're unable to, to give a a clear description on the the suspect's face and all. So once he hears from Paris months later that it was Riley. And he tells the cops this. Now the cops, you know, they put their six pack together. So they have my photo, my DMV photo, and five other guys that somewhat look like me. When I look at the six pack, the guys look nothing like me. Their background pictures are white. My background picture is a blue, the blue uh, picture that you have as a background at the DMV, you know? So it's like, pick this guy as essentially what this six pack is saying. This guy's picture is the one that stands out. This is what we want you to pick. All right. That that's enough. That's an eyewitness account victim of this is the guy. That's enough to get the search warrant. And in that search in in getting that search warrant, uh, will we find any evidence that leads back to the crime? Um I had been at his home 20 times over a two-year period partying. Uh, so so in, in, in Joe Francis' home the night that the uh, cops arrived, the night of the crime, of course, they're going to, you know, um, they're going to dust for fingerprints. So I, like I said, I've been in his home at least 20 times, you know, invited into his home, not right. having broken to it. <laughs> Uh, so apparently there was, um, out of the thousands of fingerprints that they pulled, you can imagine from all the various. I don't know what is going on. You froze again. Hello. Really? Yeah. You just I can't hear you. I you just said you. out of the, uh, out of the thousands of, you just said out of the thousands of fingerprints, they pulled yours. Out of the thousands of fingerprints that were pulled, that were found in that home, uh, that alone for them in their investigation before they ever heard of my name attached to this, that's that wasn't enough to start looking at. They have a thousand suspects at that point, right? Right. And you've uh, been in his home many times. I've been in the home, right. Um, so once he picks me out, there is now another layer yeah, that gets the arrest warrant. That gets the warrant to search my home. So, uh, and that's where the book begins. The dig right. getting the, of the the arrest going forward in my time in the county jail, dealing with uh, the whole world of, of an incarcerated person. Uh, all everything leading up to eventually having the. Uh, the preliminary hearing where Joe Francis had to come to court and withstand being questioned. Uh, this may be, this may be the best way to tie in 
or, or ra- rather wrap up how the court proceedings were going. Uh, there's two 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 big things that I think even a layman of law can just grab real quick that makes so much sense. So he says that I uh, had a mask on my face. Air tie. That was his initial statement on the police report. But to fit the narrative that he's able to now pick me out once Paris Hilton has given him my name uh, to play along with, yeah, yeah, I can pick him out of a lineup. He says that for some unknown reason, while I have him as my captive in his home for two hours, that I just decided to take my mask off. So when he's on the stand saying this, you know, there comes a point in the proceedings where we take a break. The bailiff takes me back to the holding cell and the bailiff is like, well, did he start praying? Because if a guy has his anonymity intact and then he decides to take his mask off, you're dead. That means he doesn't care that you see his face. Right. Right. So it's like that's something that the, the bailiff, you know, who's who sees criminal proceedings every day, all day. It's like, that makes no sense at all. It just looks like you're creating a a story to fit the moment, you know? Yeah. Uh, Another thing that comes up, um, the night of the crime, he says that I had a blue steel semi-automatic gun, which, you know, comes to be a nine millimeter. Uh, When they raid my home, they don't find uh, any nine millimeters. Shotguns, revolvers, a huge Tech Nine. Uh, so the guy is unable to tell the truth, and uh, you, as you know, that's all we're looking for in mounting a defense is to poke holes in his story, and that's what the preliminary hearing is for for the district attorney to test their the the strength of their evidence. Their evidence just happens to be this guy. He's the only witness. He's the victim. So, yeah. and he's not credible. When all of the evidence is, and it, that, that's eventually what it comes down to is they know they can't go forward with this guy as their only witness because he he doesn't see a semi-automatic handgun in the evidence um, that's laid out on the table. So he chooses to change his mind and say uh, he picks one of the 38 pistols that I have, a revolver. He said, that's the gun. The problem with that gun that he decides to say is the gun, which is completely different from a semi-automatic. The problem with that is that gun didn't come into my possession until like six months after the crime. You know, and the the district attorney and the detectives, they're the ones that lay that out based on paperwork and, you know, this gun... Riley could not have had possession of this gun until June of 2004, which is, you know, four, five, six months after the crime. So it's like the guy was just, he was just just grabbing at straws instead of just telling the truth and, you know, seeing where it goes from there. He tried to change the story to fit the evidence, which for my defense worked in our favor because that got the kidnap for ransom charge tossed out which then left me with one kidnapping charge extortion and a couple of other things and um, my attorney was able to negotiate a deal we could we could bargain you know maybe we'll what what we eventually settled on was robbery and extortion um, what does that carry work in the numbers we set on 10 year eight months we wound up negotiating a plea bargain on the charges of robbery and extortion because of the phone calls that brings in the extortion piece um robbery extortion with uh, a gun enhancement and we negotiated down to 10 years 10 years eight months was the sentence this is in the state uh, state prison. Yeah. 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 I, I was, I was in a position where I could roll the dice and take it to trial, uh, being, believing that we had already scored enough shots against his story 
but the possibility of losing that trial, you know, what was that? 30 years? Uh, life still. Yeah. Cause there still existed a kidnapping charge, which, which could, which holds a sentence of life. Um, you and know, they hate, it, putting, they hate it when you go to trial. Yeah. 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 So putting, putting my, my future in the hands of 12 people versus there's an offer here of 10 years. And, and part of my rationale was first off at that point, I had already washed my hands of crime. Even before my arrest, I really was out. I didn't owe anyone anything. I didn't have any obligations to anyone or any promises that were sitting out, you know, um, part of it was, all right, I did the crime. I just wanted to be able to get to a position where uh, there was a number that I could live with. Like, this is reasonable. Um, and what do you do on 10 years? Uh, you do a lot of writing. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> oh, well, no, I mean, oh, you mean time wise? Time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for violent offense, uh, 10 year sentence, you do uh, 85% of your time. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So I went in. I went in with a release date already, so there was no good time to be taken off. There was there was nothing. I went in with my release date already set. Okay, so you didn't lose good time when you were in. No, nah, you can lose time. You go to the hole, but you yeah. can get it back. As long well, as they don't. That's how it is. Yeah. In the feds, you you go in the feds, they immediately calculate your good time, but you could lose it. You could lose it, yeah, yeah. And with a certain amount of days or months clean, you could get that time back. As long as you don't catch another charge while you're in there, uh, it's reasonable to believe you'll leave on your release date. So did you get any halfway house? No, no, just straight parole. Uh, halfway house are for guys that are, you know, getting out to get out earlier. I would, my date of release was set from going in and there was no extra time coming off. Hmm. Okay. Um, and when you were incarcerated, you, what you wrote your book? Uh, I, I wrote it once I got out. I, I did a lot of note taking while I was in just observations and looking at the society that I was in and you know, observations of like, that's an, an interesting character. That's that situation is interesting. Uh, eventually figuring out what I will write about, just knowing that I was living situations that uh, aren't for the everyday person in society. Uh, realizing that the society that I was living in, it was a fully functioning society, hyper violent. Uh, the rules were set going back 40, 50 years with the gangs and the race structure. Uh, no matter how strong-willed or tough you are, you're not going in there and changing the rules. It's set. Right. Um, some of the imaginary crimes that an inmate can commit against the rules that other inmates put on each other, you know. Uh, a lot of your life in there is about negotiating whose rules you're going to follow the rules of the institution, which are the rules of the law of the land or the rules that the inmates place on each other. You know, uh, you, you, you decide to follow one set of rules that can, that can get you crossed up with the other, <laughs> the other set of guys of, of lawmakers, so to speak. So yeah, it's a, it's an, it's a tight rope walk. It's nonstop negotiating with, uh, factions and, you're just one guy. You fall in line and put your head down, and hopefully you make it to that release date. What What did you do uh, for like a, for work? Like, did, did you have a, a yeah. distribution job? First, for the first couple of years, I, I was a, my first prison I went to was corporate. Uh, I started off on a level four yard, which is you know high security, and then my points drop, and I went to. Uh, a uh, level three yard. And for the next three years, I worked in the, the kitchen with uh, uh, washing pots and pants, you know, about two, 3,000 pots and pants a day. 
Oh, the steam, uh, the moisture, the oh, yeah, yeah, wow, yeah. The the one the one good part about that job is a uh, older dude from Boston that I worked with, and that was our soul. No one came into our workspace. You know, I get to work, and you know, he had a cheese sandwich made for already or eggs or whatever. So we'd work out just nonstop bullshitting around with each other. But that was our time. Those couple of hours we were at work that all the other stuff going on around us didn't exist. I, it, the nice thing about working in, you know, in prison is like, it really helps the time. Yeah. You know, even if it's a shitty job, right. at least it's, it gets you out of there for a second. You know, even if yeah. you're, even if you're just sweeping up the fucking compound, at least it's like, I have, you have something yeah. to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this guy from Boston, uh, he hated California prison politics. You know, he, he's, he's like, you know, the criminal through and through, you know, he just, he and his guys that came out to California to get some weed and they got busted in a sting. So here he is in California where he's doing his time. Uh, but he hated all the racial politics that were here. You know, he's like, this just doesn't exist where he's from, but he knows he's not about to change to what's already been said. So he just gets in line uh he, him meeting me and i'm working with him to him it was like oh a couple of hours of reprieve from all this bullshit that's going on great so you know that was that was that's that filled my first three years bullshit going on constantly no 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 uh no mistakes about that it's prison and um there's different factions going at it on a daily to some degree um I then left there and uh, went into the uh, fire camp program. Okay. Uh, got kicked out of that. Different well, so there's a riot. Why? There's a this. Um, go back to another institution. Why'd you get kicked out of the fire program? Well, there was one. Initially, there was one. Um, there was a staff member who said she knew me. Uh, so... That's a no. She has to report that she knows an inmate, knows me from free society. Yeah, yeah. Um, she has the option to say, hey, I don't have a problem with this guy being here. Um, or she could say, hey, I would rather for him not be here. Right. All right. She doesn't want to be looked at by other cops as like maybe she's showing me favor or whatever. Mm -hmm. So most of them say, hey, get this guy out of here. As the inmate, you got no say. You, you go where they tell you. Yeah. Yeah, I remember there was a guy who actually went to a high school with one of the COs, and he's in our office four or five days in a row. And I remember my celly going, "Well, that guy lasts long." And I was like, "No, that's I'm I'm it's, it's been five days. I'm shocked he's still here." Listen, the next day he was on the pack out. Yeah, gone. They just shipped him. Yeah, and and he was so blatant about it, like. He's sitting on our desk. He's talking. They're up late. They're laughing after count. He's in the office talking. It's like, what yeah. are you doing, bro? Do you want to yeah. get shipped? Yeah. You know, you're just stupid. Yeah, he was in La La Land. I mean, I, I was in another place with a, a CEO who I had known from this from outside. Um, he made the announcement to the cop, but his thing was, I have no problem. Like, he wasn't. He didn't work the yard I worked on. Uh, he didn't work the yard that I lived on. He had worked like an overtime shift and he saw me. Yeah. Oh, okay. But so, you know, he just has to send the memo to the authorities, but he's like, we're, we don't, we're not on the same yard, so I'm never going to see the guys. So no big deal. But just to keep himself in the clear, he had to make the statement. This lady, she, she believed that, uh, that there, we would come in contact with each other. I remember there was another guy. He knew somebody. I knew another CO. I remember we were walking around like the guy had just got there and the CO saw him and walked up to him and talked to him for like a minute and walked off. And he was, and this guy had just been there. He's like, yeah, I, I know that guy. And I know his brother like from the street or something. And, the, and he said, listen, bro. He said, don't tell anybody that you know me. He's like, I'm not going to mention it. He is. I mean, don't tell your buddies. Don't tell, you know, he's like, don't, he said, you tell somebody, they tell somebody, he said, you're going to get shipped. He goes, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. He said, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, and I, that's the thing is in federal prison, they just, they'll just ship you. 
That's it. Yeah, a little oh. gasoline therapy, right? Now, I mean, yeah. so, uh, uh, okay, so, so, yeah, the the one job, and then you were right. You didn't do any other writing. That was really it. You didn't, because like, you write now. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I I'd call home. I call to different buddies every couple of weeks, every month or whatever. My buddy Scotty Khan, he, he every time I called him, he would always ask me, you know, what are you working on? What are you writing? So, you know, I'd do short stories or whatever. I'd mess around. I just did a lot of note taking. Just, uh, you know, details about certain people, certain scenarios. Uh, so when I came out, when I have, when I made parole, I already had laid out the the story I was going to tell. So you know, me writing it, it was just it just flowed because I I had already sat with it for so long. I had already known exactly what I wanted to talk about. Uh, so st- coming out, I just set a couple of weeks aside and just went balls to the wall and wound up finishing the manuscript, which eventually became the the memoir, uh, like in nine days. It was just, it, it, it was, it sat with me so long. I had already had it so detailed in notes that writing it was the easy part. Right. Yeah. I, I, had, I had lived it, you know? Yeah. I, I was going to say, I, I wrote my memoir, but the, it was, it, when I was locked up, but it took me like a year, but it, I also rewrote it like three times. Right. I didn't really know what I was doing. Right. You know? right. So, you know, I wrote it like rewrote it three times and then I started writing other guys' stories. But the last like six months to a year that I was locked up, I was in a, in a drug program called RDAP. And uh, that I actually took notes the whole time I was there because I knew I didn't have time to write anything. But it was such a bizarre experience to be in a residential drug program inside of a federal prison. And it, and the stuff that was happening there was so insane. So I just made tons of notes. And that really was probably the fastest book that I wrote. You know, And I didn't have an outline, but I did have just a series of, of really good notes. And I knocked that book out within a, a couple of months just. Yeah. Yeah, once you get into flow and, you know, you know what you want to talk about, having lived in that world, you know, you you hope that your writing translates to the reader being able to smell the funky guy's feet who's a couple of bunks over, you know? All right. <laughs> you, you hope you can uh, have that detailed and very clearly understood that, you know, uh, that's why you don't like that guy. It's like the guy's done nothing to you, but I can smell his feet right. from bumps over, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to give the reader a, a good understanding of the boredom, the violence, uh, the rules that defy logic. You know what bothered me the most, probably? The noise. Right. It was so loud in prison like people yeah. don't think about that and you're never you're like never alone like i was in a yeah. medium and at least in the medium there was you know you had some of the cells were two-man cells so at some point the doors would close and it's just you and your celly and it's semi quiet and it's quiet but after i got out of the medium and i went to the low man it's never quiet ne- you know <laughs> maybe four o'clock in the morning yeah or, you know right yeah, there there is that you, you yeah realizing you're you're not alone, even when you are in a cell. If you are even are in a single man cell, you're still not alone. Yeah, there's there's people around you. Every every, every couple of months, the power would go out. Uh, there'd be about a, a three to five second delay before the backup generators kick in, but uh, the power would go out two in the morning and that deafening silence would kick in because you don't even hear the buzzing sound uh, from the lights. You don't hear uh, the sound of, of various electrical uh, outlets. You don't hear that buzzing sound of electricity passing. 
which then you realize, oh shit, this is real silence right here. All the sounds that kick in that are just constantly a part of the prison life. It's like, ah, you know, there is no escape. The, the noise, no doubt. It's like, shut up already. Like, what are you talking about? I've heard that story 20 times. Actually, two years ago when I heard you say that story, you didn't have a Cadillac. You had an old Chevy, you know? It's like, you know, you, you're telling it now to a new guy, so you think you're going to upgrade the car in that same story. All right, you can have that one, you know? So what are you doing now? Uh, writing. Uh, second book was released, um, collection of short stories. Uh, wrote on the first season of a show on CBS uh, that is about it centers around the inmate firefighter program in oh, the okay. state prison. And you're you're a, one of the writers. Uh, I worked on the first season uh, okay. of the show. It's uh, going into the second season. You know, we just came off this writer strike, but the show centers around uh, an inmate who goes into this inmate firefighter program to get more time cut off his his sentence right uh just so happens that um it's the 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 where the place where the uh, firefighter program is most of them are in northern cal in the wood wooded areas uh the inmate firefighters work in the uh with the department of forestry um it just so happens the town that that fire camp is in that he's assigned to his mother and father are in the uh, fire divisions. So he now has to engage with them. Uh, and what got him to prison is laid out and revealed. And it's a family drama. It's uh, it's uh, called Fire Country on CBS. So it was a great experience. It was my first time in the writing room uh, for television. And um, yeah, looking forward to more seasons of whatever. Looking forward to selling a show of my own, no doubt. But uh, it's a great experience, and you know, it's a collaborative thing writing for television versus writing a film where you know you yeah. go off in your own cave. Yeah, that was. Yeah, I was gonna say that must be weird. You know, the whole are is everybody assigned certain individuals to write for, or like how I don't I understand. Do you, does one person write an episode and then? Uh, somebody else just edits it? Is it like having an editor or how to... No. So 11, 11, 12 writers in the room. There's, say, 22 episode season. Um, you have episode... You're assigned episode three and episode 11. But this week we're working on, let's say, the episode three. It's going to take us two, three weeks for us to break the whole room we're giving our input. We we already know where this story is going to go for the whole season, the season arc. So we have each episode has to be working towards getting us to those that part in the at, by the end of the season where we want to where we want to be. Mm. So each episode, an individual that is his episode. He is given that credit for that episode, but everyone has input. So when the episode is eventually when we get to the point of writing that episode, uh, you as that the author of that episode, you may hand out scenes to other folks to write. I may get three, four scenes. You hand out a couple here or there. Um, so there is that collaborative part there. It then goes off to the production company, then the studio, and they have their input. So there may be reworkings. There's plenty of times where they just kick it back and it's like you got to start from ground one because... Jimmy can't die. Jimmy can't die and Jimmy can't kill anyone. You know, it's like you guys have Jimmy killing someone. We want to keep this character. Uh, he might be. He may be a spinoff. He may be as a, we see him as being a spinoff. We got to keep him. So those those conversations happen and those conversations uh, and uh, to a large degree starts informing the decisions we make in the storytelling. That's horrible. Yeah, That's horrible. Uh, that yeah, you got to gotta be frustrating. Well, as a writer, you check your ego. Yeah. Because you're in a room with 10, 11, 12 other folks that are just as talented as you. Uh, there, There is a goal. Uh, there is a format for television that's different than writing uh, just for film. 
Right. Uh, there's a format that's different from network than you know something you would see on a streamer on cable. Uh, definitely, it's different than uh, writing a novel. Yeah, you know, novel you can do a whole lot with exposition. You can do a whole lot with real colorful language to describe characters and how this person talks and this and that. You don't have that in television. Yeah, you know, you you, you got to format. No, I mean. You got to hit it hard. Yeah. How long have you been out? Ten years. It was, yeah, ten years. Nice. How long were you on? Uh, uh, you weren't on supervised release, probation, right? Were you? You were released uh, on some parole. kind of parole. Yeah, I was. Uh, I had a three-year parole. Uh, so I had finished parole in 2017. Yeah, okay. uh, finished in April 2017. My birthday's in May. I was turning 40. I took off to Cuba. <laughs> okay. Or I did I spend my birthday in Cuba just to kind of celebrate being off parole as well as a new era, a new decade of life, you know, 40 on up. Okay. 40? Yeah. You're 40? I'm 46 now. I, I had turned 40 in 2017. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. All of this gray, that's <laughs> evidence. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm it's it's I it's super thick on me. Right, right. Yeah. Hey, if you guys like the interview, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Also, we're going to leave uh, a link to Riley's memoir in the description box. So if you want to grab his book, it's on Amazon. I don't know if there's an Audible, but there probably is. So click the uh, click the link and buy the book. I really appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor, leave me a comment, share the video, and consider joining my Patreon. Really appreciate it. See ya. Hit.